Hello and welcome to this class on state and development. Since it's your first class, I feel it's my obligation to give you some uh, uh, clarity on the title of this course, uh, State and Development. And uh, it turns out that we will actually spend quite a bit of time on just the first part of the title. Uh, and uh, this is because a large part of what I aim to do in this course is to not take that first word state at face value. As students in this department, and especially if you are students in uh, doing an MA in development studies, uh, you've had quite a bit of debate and discussion about the word development. So why not have uh, a similar kind of uh, engagement with the word uh, state? Why take it for granted? Uh, why shouldn't we uh, really try and explore uh, what it is we mean when uh, we use it so casually? So if you're, uh, it's, it's, it's a little less casual in everyday language than say society, and we'll come to that in a different part of the course maybe. Uh, I have a great deal to talk about uh, society and uh, we'll have some readings on that. All of this, of course, in relation uh, to the first part of the course, which is uh, state. Now, state uh, is uh, used uh, largely by specialists, and I want to start accusing them of using it uh, fast and loosely. Uh, and uh, I also uh, want to ask the question, what is our common uh, understanding of the word state. So unfortunately, or for better for, or for worse, I should say, uh, we have the names of states, we call Tamil Nadu and, uh, and Karnataka and uh, Assam states. Uh, and, and then what we mean by them, if you start looking at it a little more formally, is that these are states that form a union, right? So the word state is hiding behind it a set of meanings already in that uh, phrase, the state of California, the state of uh, Tripura, and so on. Right? And then when statehood, uh, in a formal sense within a federation of states, is, is starting to uh, either appear from nowhere, like uh, Telangana did, or, or, or disappear uh, from view as, as some states have become uh, union territories, and so on. These, 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 are, these are again questioning the very category of the state, right? And this is state with a capital S, uh, and I would call it the proper noun understanding of the state, or rather a very specific legal understanding of the state. What I want to think about for much longer though, is the, uh, is the common noun meaning of the word state. And this is something that we see in a variety of uh, uh, situations, but especially among scholars. Right? Uh, in the media, of course, you'll say, well, the state has acted too uh, harshly in this case or something like that. And, and that's usually somebody, a journalist, echoing uh, what a, 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 a scholar of the social sciences might be saying. Right? It's less common uh, in, you know, I don't, I doubt, I, I never heard it, for instance, uh, in, uh, you know, normal, ordinary conversations with my family or in, uh, until well after I went to high school. Uh, I don't remember any of my school years, really, the word state in a um, common noun sense, that is a small letter uh, S uh, uh, in state uh, ever being used. So that's something uh, to think about. Uh, why is this uh, professional term, when did it arrive, and so on. So I've been looking it up. I look, I usually, uh, 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 when I want to look up something, one of the first places I go to uh, is uh, uh, Wikipedia, actually. I will come to that later. But mostly for, for words in particular, like the state, I go also to the Oxford English Dictionary, because the Oxford English Dictionary 
uh, is uh, 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 an extraordinary resource because it tries to trace the etymology. You know, what were the first, earliest users of this word? Uh, who used it in what kind of sentence, right? That sort of thing. And that's, uh, that's a great thing to do. And then the other uh, point I wanted to make, and if I can find this uh, very quickly, I will, I will do that. Uh, yes, here it is. Uh, I also use this book by Raymond Williams. I'm sorry, you see a mirror image of it, perhaps. No, you don't. Uh, you see Raymond Williams' keywords. And this book uh, came out several years ago. Raymond Williams is uh, uh, what's known as a, a cultural theorist. Uh, he is, so this is, this is a new domain in the humanities and social sciences, uh, probably about 50 uh, years or less uh, in age. You know, some would argue longer, but, but really what uh, 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 Raymond Williams, who was a professor of literature, tried to do was to create a set of about 100 words, uh, uh, which are over here. Uh, and <clears throat> these words he tried to uh, uh, provide about you know, short commentaries on, uh, anywhere from 800 to uh, 2,000 words. Right? Trying to describe, again, his, his method, his approach is to try and follow this through a genealogy, trying to understand First of all, the, 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 the roots of the word, uh, family history, the genealogy of the family history, as you know, right? So, so when you start looking at the origins of a word, you try to look uh, uh, at its beginnings, when was it first used, in what context, what did it look like, uh, when it was used, and so on. And he doesn't actually have the word state in this fine volume either as a separate entry. Instead, if you go to the word society, you see a fair amount of discussion on state, which is itself interesting, as I will explain in perhaps another lecture very soon. Right. Today, what I want to do, uh, before we spend too much time on my talking just uh, extempore, uh, uh, today what I thought I'd do is uh, to follow up on uh, something that I've pledged to myself, which is I'll give you a couple of readings every week and I'll try to go through at least one of them with you so that you understand where I'm coming from and how, what's these other disparate but not too difficult uh, set of readings, how they relate to what this course is about, right? So uh, it seems to me that rather than go through uh, the conventional sort of pedagogy, which you can go through uh, in Wikipedia and any number of fine textbooks in political science and political theory, by the way, which is just theories of the state. In fact, in your uh, opening uh, introductory screen in uh, um, Moodle, you will find that there's a very short video that I've posted about a book that you might wonder what relation it might possibly have with a course uh, on state and development must all be wondering when you, when you watch that video, because that video, just to explain to anybody who hasn't seen it yet, is about, uh, is, is, a, is an introduction to a series of about 12 or 15 lectures given by uh, Dave Harris. Dave Harris is a retired academic, I think, and he's living in a beautiful countryside home in, uh, in Devon. And uh, he takes us through these journeys on his walks and, 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 and motorcycle rides and so on uh, through that countryside while he's actually trying to explain a very complex book. And that book is A Thousand Plateaus, which I hope you will have an occasion to read or at least view through this, uh, this type of introduction uh, at some point uh, in, in the, the rest of your uh, career as, uh, as a social science student. But it really doesn't have much of a bearing on this course at all, that book, I mean. I wanted to demonstrate through that video is that that's the kind of methodology I, I think is very helpful for going through a series of texts, right? Because what we have uh, when we want to try and understand something in the 
humanities and social sciences is in fact largely what is correctly and appropriately uh, termed by many cultural theorists as a series of texts. So we have something written down, some record, some archaeological record, some kind of thing that we have to interpret. And through that interpretation, we begin to form slightly better understandings of the world. This is another uh, deep philosophical point made by many people uh, around this whole process of trying to interpret, come to some kind of understanding of science. So the scientific method of discovery is not reality showing us something and us saying, Eureka, we found it, right? That's, that's never how understanding in science works, not even in the natural sciences. That is a very a strange mythology, and I won't go to the, into the reasons for why it has persisted for so long. But instead, I think there's, there's broad consensus on this. The way in which knowledge and knowledge acquisition works is by creating shared narratives. And those shared narratives are not arbitrary narratives. They're based on reason, evidence, and justification, right? which are very important criteria that we can all recognize. Let me say a few words about James Scott, what this paper in particular and why it's important, why I have assigned it to you. So James C. Scott is actually a political scientist at Yale. I discovered James Scott because he, he famously had written a book or Weapons of the Week, and it became uh, a kind of a peasant's perspective, of a sociology of how peasants respond to you know, domination uh, in various contexts. If, they, if, they, if they're too overpowered by uh, physical force, by, by armies, by militia, by, by thugs, and uh, by the police, uh, this, this, which is where the state power comes in, then they, they are too constrained to actually revolt, but they still nevertheless find ways to respond. And, and an accompanying book to that is called The Moral Economy of the Peasants, where essentially forms of resistance, the peasant resistance that come out of the, the kinds of conditions under which they are placed. A subsequent book of his, which I never liked, was Seeing Like the State. When it came out, I felt, you know, it was too shallow, it had been said before, and so on. You know, I was, you know, I was uh, younger then, and I felt I had this great uh, sense uh, of uh, superiority to so, you know, sort of somebody calls it the arrogance of ignorance. That's the attitude with which I, I approach uh, Scott then, and then I forgot about it. And until 2011, mm -hmm. when I came across this particular set of Tanner lectures on human values. These are lectures that he gave uh, at Harvard uh, University, and it's a great resource. If you're, if you're struggling to find resources about scholars and work in the humanities and social sciences, you should look up Tanner lectures and see who else has given a Tanner lecture. Many, many, many famous people have given those lectures, and the idea is that these are public lectures. These are lectures uh, given to the public by scholars, but they give three or four such lectures at length, trying to explain their body of work uh, to, to scholars. And, and Scott has been active as an academic since 1967. That's, that's way too long, even for me. This is a little bit about him. He's a Sterling professor. I don't know if, when it says 1967, I don't know if that's the year he joined or that's just the endowment. He, he's probably been endowed by the class of 1967. So this is the first of his, I think these are three lectures, if I'm not mistaken, uh, three Tanner lectures that he gives. And this lecture, uh, he kind of begins with uh, an apology of sorts, but it's also describing his own mission. For the past two decades, he's thus far been on a rather futile quest, he says, rather humbly he says that. And the particular dragon I've been meaning to slay, or at least report on first hand, can be described by the awkward word sedentarization. So just let me preface my reading of this paper with, with a few more words. So what I'm going to do, because I think this is a very important first step in, in approaching any complex book or project, is to develop strategy for the first 10 or 15 minutes. When you start to open a book, you, you, you actually have to spend about 10 or 15 minutes without starting from the first page. It's like unwrapping your Christmas present or your birthday present before time, before you're actually allowed to look at it 
and and you it's, and you, you you sneak your way into your, into a book or a paper that way it seems to me that you actually save about 80 to 90% of the time you'd actually need to to read and understand the whole project i mean this is a remarkable trick i've had to discover because you know there are 128 million books according to google i'm sure that uh, if i knew just saw the titles of about 0.1 or 0.01% of all those books because I wouldn't have time to actually go scan millions of lists, any small sample of them. I want to read or at least understand what's in all of them because that's how uh, enriching and large the field uh, of uh, books that I would want to read. Now, now this, is, this, is a, this is an enormous uh, burden on me. I don't have that much time to actually do all this. I spend especially uh, now, but even for, for many years, I spend a, a good part of my waking life being very active, doing other kinds of work, mostly domestic work. You know, I don't have enough hours in the day of reading, so I end up having maybe around uh, six, seven hours uh, to do reading work other than another four or five hours to do writing and other kind of academic work, including preparing for classes and so on. So I, I certainly don't have the time of my life to, to read a very large fraction of these books, uh, especially if I assume that each book will take at least about three hours to read. So a good part of my strategy has been to decide what I will actually read in full. And the, the, the exercise I've given you to say, well, uh, if you can read about six or seven op-eds every day, that length of material, in addition to the op-eds that you read, actually read. And it's not hard to do. It's not hard to do because you can snatch enough time to read about uh, 1,500 words at, at one go. Very easily, right? Within about 20 minutes, you've, you've done 1,500 words. And so I like to think of my time in 20-minute segments. I mean, that's the way we've kind of come down to. There used to be a, a, a time in my life, but I really don't remember this very well because uh, I've been working on two jobs. I've had a day job and my night job of reading and, and, and getting into the social sciences uh, well before I became an academic, when now my day job is that job, which is, which is a great relief. So the strategy I would use for approaching this paper or any other paper is as follows. I would say, take a first look at the context. Where is it coming from? And I've already given you the context. I've told you a little bit about uh, who James C. Scott is, uh, and I've, I've told you his, what the Tanner lectures are, and, and now, you, now you're starting to look at the first lecture, and you know from the screen here that there are 45 pages, so I have to go through another 42 pages. And if I read, if I start reading at a pace of, I don't know, one or two pages, every two minutes, so a minute a page, say, uh, that's a fast read, but this is a, this is a paper where it's easy to do, and I've got a, the next 45 minutes to finish that. Now, what will I get out of that if there are a lot of twists and turns in that exercise? So if I don't want to spend 45 minutes going through this lecture, or maybe it'll turn out to be an hour. If I only want to do this in 20 minute segments, I can tell you a speedy way to do this. Because if you spend 15 or 20 minutes finding out about the paper, looking at the different parts of the paper, looking at its beginning, the context and all that, then the trick is that you might be able to do two pages a minute to, to read the whole thing because your brain has already been sort of primed into the central argument of that paper. Remember, this is a plot. It's a plot just like a murder mystery, except unlike in a murder mystery, you don't want to go through the whole process and the thrill of finding out who did it because it's, it's, a, it's a different type of plot. And in this plot, it's better for you to know what the end, end point is or the end points are and then to see how is this person actually going through this game or this maze to get there. So if you know the starting points and the conclusions, then that motivates you to go through a different kind of quest. So you have to feel motivated to read the paper and the best motivation you can have 
is to actually find out as much as you can in advance before you step into the front door. And, and so that's what I want to do now, having spent many hours on this lecture, uh, this series of lectures, and the book that came out after that, Epiphany Creating Book in the World of Social Science, in ways that, that have affected me personally quite deeply, but I know quite many other people as well. In, in some ways, what I'm trying to invite you to do in this course is to start with something that I feel is now opening out a particular set of pathways for trying to understand uh, society, history, and the, the wheels and operations of the world in, in, in a macro sense. This is a, a, a kind of a, a Hegelian quest, if you like, to try and see, can we say something about the, the shifts in humanity's course as a whole over many thousands of years? If you look at the title of this lecture, the late Neolithic multi-species resettlement camp, that already tells you we're going very far back. We're going very far back and we're going on a, on a quest like a knight errant. It's like a, a, a mythological quest. That, that should be intriguing, at least to some of you. What is this, what is this about? What can, we, what can we say from going back several thousand years uh, say tens of thousands of years and then looking at some transitions what does that tell us that that is going to be novel and it turns out that and i'll tell you the plot right away what changed in the course of history what changed in the past ten thousand years or slightly longer than that was a geophysical shift that took place in a period called the Little Ice Age. And we had the Little Ice Age was actually quite a big thing. It covered most of the Earth in ice or in very cold conditions, tundra-like conditions. And in parts of Southern Europe, you used to see this tundra grass, or at least paleontologists have evidence of that, called the, the dryas. And that is the name of this uh, spring flower that you only see in the tundra, but showing up in various parts of Europe. This period is also called the Younger Dryas. And then you have the beginning of the Holocene. Uh, we are in the middle of the Holocene, or actually uh, people would say we have started on Anthropocene. But that, that shift that began before what we know of as our prehistory and history in, in very, very large terms was affected by some geophysical events. And this is something you know, and strangely enough, in our COVID times, we're quite happy and willing to believe. And that's a very important kind of an uh, epiphanic uh, moment as well for, uh, for, 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 for much of humanity, right? that, that, that suddenly we understand that the, the, the relationship between the physical world and the uh, our social and cultural worlds are very, very close together. I mean, the, the, the distance is actually very tight. The natural world is part of us. It's not, uh, it's not something exterior, it doesn't have some remote instrumental way uh, effect on us, like, you know, uh, we can value it in terms of how much it produces for us. So we don't, we can no longer take, make those kinds of assumptions, which is to say that this, that, that the studying this long history has a new meaning and significance and relevance for us that we can all appreciate. That should give you that motivation, that sort of sense of urgency to understand what this fuss is about. So what else is he saying? I'll quickly go down to uh, parts of this. I have not marked very much, but just a, just a little bit to draw your attention to the argument. So he says one transition that took place is the transition to fire. Fire was a kind of a domestication. And, and we'll come to that word. We'll try to understand what, that mean, what he means by domestication. For those of you who've already read a little bit of Foucault or, or come across his work, this should be of interest to you, especially his work around docile bodies of, of, of structured forms of disciplining. And it's not the prison that disciplines you. It's the classroom that you now remember in, as some kind of a, a, a vague antique experience that you can no longer feel comfortable enough to, to not look at critically, even if you go back to that experience, this, this experience of remote learning has changed your and my type of disciplining. 
So Foucault is a very useful person to think about that. And so when we come into this domestic, the domus, the domus is the, really the heart, the family fire. So all of that has certain associations with patterns of domestication. So the domestication of fire was also a domestication of humans, as, you, as, as he will point out. So of course, that happened before the Holocene. Fire was a late Pleistocene ancestor of Thomas Edison, uh, he says. Those transformations took place uh, tens of thousands of years ago, uh, probably hundreds of thousands of years ago. And, but then you had these kinds of events. And one of them, Scott argues, and there seems to be a lot of evidence to, to support his argument, what happened was when the ice and the cold thawed, what had happened, what, what used to be a norm throughout parts of Europe, but also uh, Africa and, and Asia, where people were in relative areas of abundance. In certain, parts, certain of those parts, certainly in Europe, towards uh, the Mediterranean and elsewhere in, uh, in Iraq, Mesopotamia, you see the formation of peoples becoming sedentarized. And Scott goes through the evidence, goes through the archaeological, the paleontological evidence of, uh, say, a 10,000 year period after the thaw. And he says, and of course, he's describing fire, which took place before that, but this is sort of used as a technology. Uh, and, and, and this ability to transform the landscape more to their liking. So Scott is describing a set of, and these were not, so, so, so you have to remember two things about this. One is these are not preordained uh, types of shifts, meaning uh, you can't predict that, well, first humans will discover fire and then out of that they'll discover uh, the next set of things that they have the ability to transform the la landscape. So it was only inevitable that they come to settle farming. So you can't make those kinds of judgments because there are, there's no evidence for that in the first place. And it also is not necessary because there are other explanations. There are explanations like epigenetic change, things that change like from a seed to uh, germination, but not in some necessary way, but in some stochastic way with certain conditions, with other relations to the environment that create the conditions of possibility for transformation. This stochastic, organic way of thinking about uh, shifts and change so there is more justifiable, one might say, than mechanical changes through cause and effect or direct cause and effect. But nevertheless, it is clear that what happened as a result of these geophysical forces over long periods of time. What are those forces after the Great Trias during the thaw? Is for 2,000 years or more, you had conditions where people were really finding certain areas of Earth very productive, but productive because of silt production and the experience of learning how grains could be cultivated. And that took a very long period of time, if not before uh, at the very earliest around 7000 BC, usually after that in Mesopotamia uh, and other parts, other uh, river deltas of the world, including, of course, Harappa in the Indus and Gagar Hakka basins. So, so you have a long transformation that he describes in this paper. And uh, uh, let me try and end this lecture because, I, I, like I said, I'm not doing the whole paper with you, but I'm going through the argument so that you feel comfortable and, and interested to read it. Why is early farming taken up? He goes through and then, and why would they, uh, so, so, so this is another point that he makes, which is very important as a counter argument to the argument that is usually made that, well, hunter gatherers found it more useful to and more productive to settle down and uh, uh, you know, cultivate rice. He says just the opposite. That, there's, that their non-sedentary life was much more productive in small groups, in bands. In, uh, they were not hunter-gatherers, but he really says forager hunters and occasion hunters. And because there was plenty to be foraged, and it was not, not just nuts and fruit and seeds like uh, the cartoons like to uh, depict it, but also a lot of legumes and tubers, which they could leave and create these kinds of rhizomatic underground 
relationships with each other and kept on growing. There was no effort. It was a do-nothing type of engagement with the production of food. And instead, they were doing certain types of activity. We don't know what at all because whatever evidence that we have left behind is scarce and only from about, say, 50,000 years ago, if not older. Left to their own devices, they would have avoided intensive agriculture until they pressed hard against the carrying capacity of their environment. When obliged to cultivate, they first opted for the forms of agriculture that offered the highest return for their labor. And, and then he goes on to describe that these were quite easy and, and provided enough time for the part-time farmers. Over time, this changes into certain types of cultivated fields, certain types of grain cultivation that requires increasingly more labor. And the apogee, the highest amount of labor needed uh, in any kind of grain cultivation is wet rice, wet paddy, because you have multiple types of labor from sowing to transplantation, flooding, harvest, and so on. Grain harvest is, is at minimum 10 to 1 ratio from harvest to seed. Rice is actually about three times that. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that in a small plot of land, if you put, start putting in uh, a lot of labor, you get uh, large amounts of grain. And that, uh, he, uh, he argues, over time creates these kinds of networks, this very powerful bands of people who control labor. So this is the first formation of class, if you will, in the, in the Marxist sense of the owners of the means of production and, and those who work on those means of production. What is collected as rent or surplus value that Marx describes is the sort of the initial pot uh, for the growing wealth. But that's not the, the only argument he's making. He's not just saying this is how class is formed and this is, this is what happened. He's saying a whole series of other things as well. That this domestication was actually the kinds of sets in motion, the kinds of activities that require the, the, the transformation of social and cultural life. From forager hunters, you start forming urbanized settlement. And he says, these are, these are the kinds of things that are required. So from field clearing and preparation, uh, using all these technologies, fire plow and, and art is a type of plow uh, and harrow, to sowing cultivation and weeding to constant vigilance as the field ripens, the crop organizes much of our timetable. So, Particular word there is timetable. What Scott is, is in fact saying is that we, we are constrained increasingly by the lack of time that we have as opposed to being forager hunters. Our day is now organized into hours, and those are hours, and, uh, if not in a formal sense in this period, or clocks, but still a set of activities that, that fully take up your time. And all of these historians have discovered has been quoted as women's work. So, so you start to see a division of labor around settled agriculture, sedentarization. I'm going to stop pretty soon, even though in terms of pages, we're not even about a third of the way through. The other two lectures go to subsequent periods. So this is definitely a very long period of time, but in our history, because it's, it's from the pre-modern to the early modern forms. But during that time, he says, you had a long golden age of these non-state peoples. So his, his argument is very before the 1500s, we, we are pretty clear that those people who live outside of the entities that we call states, which are made up of settlements, as sedentarization is the engine of that. For, for much of human history, until the 1500s, the non-state peoples, the foragers and hunters, were the majority. And that's, that's a shocking revelation to most of us. So we feel, oh, we've all lived in these uh, kingdoms under these, uh, we had these rajas and some of them were fantastic. And now we're moving on uh, to democracy. So this is a nice progression of humanity. And, and it turns out that that is a, a, a bit of a nice story that we've been hearing all this time. And that, that really should 
motivate you to read this whole paper. And before we, we meet tomorrow, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to give you equal motivation for the other paper, which is shorter, which in some senses is a little denser, but not really. Because this is just a build-up, a narrative that we, that we go through very quickly. 